you have a Bible this morning, you can open it up to the book of 2 Peter. There in the very back of your Bibles. 2 Peter chapter 1. And let us pray. Father, as we now come to this time in your word, we ask, Lord God, for your illuminating power to be present with us. Open our eyes, Lord God, to see, our hearts, Lord God, to understand your word. We pray, Lord God, that you'll grant unto me lips to speak it, even as you grant us hearts to hear it, to receive it, and to put it into practice. We ask now, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would be in charge of all that's happening in this moment, in this place. And for that, we thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Today, we'll be looking at a somewhat lengthy passage in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll start reading to you from that particular place with verse number 3. This is the New International Version of the Bible. This is what it says there. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this uh, very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you, for if you possess these quali qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have the, them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, this week, we are basically looking at the flip side of the coin uh, from what we looked into last week. There we were looking at how to avoid false humility. Today, uh, we are going to look at how to avoid false grace. Last week, false humility was the subject matter that we were seeking to avoid. This week, it's false grace. And now, if we look at this passage of Scripture, I think that we will see from the very start that it's speaking to this subject matter. I think in this very first phrase, God's divine power has given to us. Uh, we have encapsulated a very, uh, a very precise and, and very succinct uh, a definition of grace, uh, one that sometimes has eluded the church. We often have trouble understanding this concept of grace. We, we don't have a good grasp of what it is. Sometimes we think it's, it's almost like a magical, mystical power. God's grace is maybe in the elements of communions, or God's grace is uh, flowing over us, those kinds of thoughts. And when we think in those kinds of uh, thoughts or in those kinds of ways, basically we're thinking that grace is this somehow or another this force that's coming from God and affecting us, impacting our lives in some way. That's not a valid biblical way of looking at grace. Uh, sometimes, too, as well, we look at grace as being almost like blinders on, on the eyes of God. We have a lot of horse and buggies around here, and, and uh, every now and again, when you see a horse and buggy, you'll notice that the horse will have blinders on. Uh, of course, horses, have, where their eyes are located, they're very much uh, involved in their peripheral vision, what's there. And uh, horses sometimes can be very skittish, they can get nervous, and if something flashes through that peripheral vision, they'll, they'll act up. And so in order to keep that from happening, they'll you know, put blinders on, on horses. Sometimes we think that grace is kind of like a divine set of blinders that God wears. 
And what those blinders do is they prevent God from seeing all the things he really doesn't want to see. Like, he doesn't want to see sin, and he doesn't want to see hard-heartedness, and he doesn't want to see greed and avarice, and he doesn't want to see some of these very human uh, qualities uh, in, in people. So God has grace and these blinders that keep him from seeing it. That's really not the case either. Grace is not, not like that at all. Grace is not a, 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 an effort by God to not see what he sees. He sees what he sees. Grace is, is, uh, uh, grace is, is about the heart of God. Grace is about what's in his very soul, if you will. And, and uh, when we look at grace, what we need to see in grace is that it is, it is the way that we more or less describe what we understand God's heart is toward us, uh, God's kindness, his, his joy in, in giving, his blessings to us that are undeserved. Uh, these are the things that are coming from the way God's heart is toward us, and that's really what grace is all about. And in this particular passage of Scripture, I like this, the way that, it, that, that, uh, that is sketched out, God's heart, if you will, uh, because it says that everything that we need for a godly life is given to us, and, and therein is probably the, the most important quality of grace is that grace is about giving. Grace is about the thing that makes God give. And so in this passage of Scripture, this very first phrase really establishes that the reason that we have something, the reason that we have the what the rest of the passage is going to be talking about is this thing called grace, this this disposition in God's heart to give us, to give us not the, the thing that we earn, to give us not the thing that we deserve, to give us not the thing that somehow or another uh, we have worked toward discovery or have somehow or another mined for or prospected for, but that God gives us just on the basis of the goodness of his own character, of his own power, of his own glory, of his own goodness, out of just the quality of his own heart, God gives to us. And this is really uh, what grace is all about, that, that God has granted to us. Now, the, the words uh, as this passage is, uh, is unfolding uh, and talking about this, this giving to us uh, puts it to, in a place where it, it is in a, a particular tense. It's, it's in a middle voice. It's in the past perfect tense. And what that means is it's speaking of something that is, is already done. And that, too, is very helpful in, in, in gaining an apprehension of what grace is all about. Uh, because I tell you what, we mostly in the kingdom of God are very happy to hear that God has grace for us. And if you recall back in the days, perhaps before you came to Christ, before you were uh, given over to Christ, uh, the, 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 the message that God could have in his heart what he has toward you, that he could welcome you, that he wanted you in his kingdom, that he was willing to provide for you everything that was needed to make that happen. That was a great message. Uh, we are so glad to hear of grace often when we come to Christ. But how often is it also the case that coming to God, coming to Christ uh, because of grace, we thereafter start trying to live by works? I think that, that is a very, uh, it's a very common thing amongst Christians. Uh, we, we are so glad to hear grace, but almost after a night of sleeping on it, we are, we are uh, uh, sentencing ourselves to live by works. And that is a, uh, that's a, a, a problem. And if you recall, in, in talking about some of the things we were talking about last week, when we adopt some of those kinds of frameworks of references and we start guiding our lives <laughs> by those kinds of principles, uh, we, can end up, we can end up not avoiding false humility. I mean, we can say that we're so glad for grace, but at the same point in time, be very proud of what we've done to learn things about God and what we've done to show ourselves worthy and what we've made of our lives after coming to Christ. And See, all of that's about false humility, and we, we talked about the dangers of that sufficiently last week. Uh, grace is the foundation of all that we have in God. Grace is the foundation of everything we expect from God, everything that we anticipate from God, everything that we are hoping for, not only here and now, but in the, in the ages to come. It's, it's all founded upon grace, and grace is the basis of, of everything. But here's the situation that I think this text does develop here as we go through it, is that that's not the end of things. 
here too, I think, is a problem that is common amongst Christians, is that we're, we make much of grace, as we should, but we make much of it in this way, is that somehow or another, the grace of God basically is something that we can get in a moment, then we can go on with life as we need to live it. Now that we've taken care of that kind of a thing, then we can go on to the, uh, you know, to all the, the real life that we have to live. And, and I think that that's uh, often the case with, with Christians who are willing to embrace the concept of grace. They don't realize that there's anything that comes after that. They don't realize that there's anything that God intends to come after that. They think that, that the grace of salvation is, is all that there is to things, and it's not. For God did not save us just to save us. He saved us unto something. He saved us with a purpose in mind. And our text talks about this. Ultimately, the, the, the thing that God wants to do is he wants to share his divine nature with us. And so the purpose of salvation is not to get us out of hell, or the purpose of salvation is, is not to just get us uh, off the hook for all the ways in which we've disappointed God so that, that somehow or another he can put on blinders and, and welcome us into his kingdom. That's not it at all. The point of grace, the point of the kindness of God's heart is that he actually wants to, in that kindness, share what he experiences like. He wants to share what he knows is existence. The goodness of God, the, the, the glory of God, the wonder of God, he wants to share that with us so that we can experience it in ourselves, that we can experience it, it as our lives. And so God's grace has a point. And if a person, if a Christian... Um, is so satisfied with salvation by grace so that they kind of camp on the doorstep, if you will, of the kingdom of God, they, they don't realize that grace is meant to be a foundation upon which something can be built. And not, not realizing that, they don't, they don't build. They don't, they don't expend an effort. They don't progress. And they are willing in their own mind to write all of that off to the wonders of grace. Who needs to do that? I have grace that saves me. And if we look at things that way, if we have that kind of framework in, in, our, in our perceptions of, of being saved, I can tell you this, is we're basically going to live the life of a slug. We're going to live the life of somebody who is not experiencing the glory of God, who's not experiencing the Spirit of God, who's not experiencing the goodness of God in the sense of, of character, uh, being having that as their experience as well. They're not going to grow in those things that matter. They are merely being satisfied with, uh, if you will, a rescue uh, from, uh, from hell. Um, that's not what God's intent is for us. Now, in, in talking about some of these things, and I'm not going into great depth or detail of, of every item in this particular text of Scripture, I'm just hitting some highlights and, and dealing with how they apply to the subject matter this morning, but uh, I think it's important to understand how this comes about. Uh, how do we grow? How do we go from grace to growing in these things that God wants to share with us, the, the, this, this aspect of participation in the divine nature? How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we actually accomplish that? Well, it tells us this comes through our knowledge of Christ. This experience of the divine person, the divine nature, it comes into our experience. It becomes something that, that is our living through our knowledge of Christ. Now, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean that somehow or another, if we learn enough facts about Jesus Christ, that somehow or another we'll experience the divine nature? No. I think there too, sometimes that's a temptation that we have as Christians. Uh, we know that, that we don't want to be a slug, and so we endeavor to learn something, and so we learn maybe everything we can about the Bible. Or maybe we learn everything we can about the Trinity, or maybe we learn everything we can about 
about uh, what God was doing in the covenants, or maybe we learn everything that we can about this thing or that thing. Uh, a lot of facts, a lot of figures, things that really, when you think about it, often really uh, devolve to nothing more than trivia. And we, we think that if we know all these things, that that somehow or another is equated with the knowledge of, of God, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, and it's not. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that really, I think, clarifies that point in this particular passage is the word that's used here. It's uh, the word, the Greek word, epigonosko. Now, epigonosko is a word that means knowledge, and it's translated knowledge, but it's, it's not just trivia. It's not just facts and figures. It's a different kind of knowledge. Uh, when we talk about gnosko, knowledge, we, that's very much capable of of being more or less expressed as facts and figures, knowing what a thing is. Uh, epigenosco is a different kind of a thing. Epigenosco is an intensive, in, uh, uh, with a gnosko with the, the intensive prefix, epi, in front of it. And in having that, that uh, prefix, the word kind of uh, transforms the meaning of knowledge, and it goes from just knowing knowledge to being experiential knowledge, hands-on knowledge. The knowledge that you gain by actually experiencing a thing. Uh, and uh, in the early earlier service, I was using as an illustration a plumber, and hence our little talk with Bob at the beginning of our time this morning. Um, but uh, if you if you need to do some plumbing repairs, right, and you needed to you needed to have the knowledge of a plumber. You could go to YouTube and you could find a video. I like like YouTube for this particular reason. It's better than a how-to book in so many respects because you know they'll make a video and you'll actually get to see somebody doing it, what it looks like, and that's very helpful. But I, how many of you know that if you watch a video on YouTube about how to be a plumber, let's say how to fix something underneath the sink, that doesn't mean that you know how to fix something under the sink. There's a there's a whole gap of knowledge that goes from knowing about something to actually experiencing something. And if you want to uh, get under the sink, having learned what facts that you could learn, you go under the sink and, and, and you find out that it looked a whole lot easier on that tape than it does when you're actually doing it. It's a whole lot more uncomfortable trying to find a spot where you can work and not be cramped, your head's banging up against pipes or against cabinetry, trying to get light on something, can't find a good place to put it, any, every place you put it, it seems like you, somehow it's leaving something in shadow that you need to, to be able to see. You get a torch out, maybe you're using a torch and you can't find a good, a good way to hold it or position it so that it burns the right thing and doesn't burn the wrong thing. Trying to get your, your wrenches in there, your, your, your tools, and can't get a hold of the, of the nuts that you're trying to turn. The fittings are, are, are giving you a difficulty. Um, you know, all kinds of things like that happen. Now, you can learn about those things, I suppose, as well, uh, from a standpoint of being an observer. But there's something about actually getting your hands dirty and working with it that really makes you gain knowledge, gain epigenosco, gain experiential knowledge. And that experiential knowledge is so different than just the mere words on a page can convey. And that's what we're talking about here. We're not meant to know things about Jesus. We're meant to know Jesus by experiencing Jesus' life, by doing Jesus' things. We're, we're meant to know Jesus not on the basis of someone standing from the outside observing, but we're meant to know Jesus by actually having Jesus within us doing the things that Jesus does being the way that Jesus is, expressing the things that Jesus expresses. And in experiencing that, guess what we do? We, we know Jesus. You can know about Jesus. Lots of people know about Jesus. But knowing Jesus experientially, so that, that in your relating to somebody, you're experiencing what it's like when Jesus related to somebody, or... When you are doing the thing that's right to be done, you're experiencing the thing that Jesus experienced when he did what the, the right thing to be done. And so we have this, 
this need, if you will, this is part of God's plan for us, is that we would have experiential knowledge of Christ, and in so doing, in having that knowledge, the divine power of God would bring into our lives everything that's necessary for life and godliness. You know, it's it's uh, it takes me back. I, I don't know about if it's even something that that is used anymore, but oftentimes. Uh, uh, back in the back in my younger day, and talking about things like psychological battery, psychological testing, often they would like give a, a kid this little this little uh, wooden puzzle with all of these various kinds of uh, blocks, and they had to put the the right shape in the in the right spot, and it was I guess a, an intelligence test that didn't depend on reading or other uh, other intellectual skills. Um, I tell you what, in those kinds of tests, you know that something's wrong when somebody keeps on trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Not only is that a frustrating thing, but it's a thing that, that doesn't work. It doesn't function. Uh, it certainly doesn't lead a person to complete the task, nor does it uh, in any way, shape, or form, give the person a good experience of the task. In a lot of ways, we're kind of like squares. We're like square pegs. In our native self, in our natural self, we are square pegs. But God's intention for us is to experience what it's like being in the round hole. Now, he doesn't do that by saying to us, go out and rub off your edges. Go make yourself round and come back. I think sometimes we approach it that way. I think we approach Christianity sometimes like God has given us a command to get ourselves in shape. And so we are going to go out and sand ourselves and buff ourselves and chisel ourselves and whatever else we have to do, saw ourselves, grind ourselves, to try to get ourselves in the shape that God wants so that then we'll be able to we'll be able to know God, we'll be able to experience God, because we went out and we got ourselves in shape. But God isn't asking us to do that. God is saying, You're a square peg. That's what you were born as, that's what you are natively. And there's nothing that you can do to make a square peg round. You don't have what it takes. This is some of the things that we were talking about out of uh, last week's message when we, when we were citing things like Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 1. In human nature, we're square pegs. We, we're, we don't fit with God. And the expectation of God is not that you go out and make yourself the right shape. The expectation of God is that he gives you the right shape. He gives you the right shape. Through his Holy Spirit abiding in you, he more or less transfers to you the right shape. And in that right shape, you get to fit in the hole. And in doing so, guess what? You experience what it's like being round. You would never know what it was like being round on your own. And to tell you the truth, even if you went out and tried to scuff off some, some of your sharp edges, you would still in your own heart know you were faking it. You would still in your own heart know, I'm just a square peg faking it. God doesn't want you to live that way. God, through promises, has given to us the Holy Spirit. And giving us the Holy Spirit, he gives us this shape. This shape that fits into the experience that he is commanding for us. So that we are able to experience as our own. Something that's important to us. It's, it doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from who we are or what we are. It doesn't come from our own volition. It comes from the grace of God. And God has made his promises concerning this. And our knowledge of Christ is not something that is gained by you know, sweating and toiling and trying to make ourselves something that we're not. Our knowledge of Christ is, comes from embracing what God has promised, understanding the truth of it, and going along with it. When we do, we experience it for ourselves. We get to know what it's like being a plumber. We get to know what it's like being 
Christ-like. We get to know what it's like being the Son of God. We get to know what it's like being right with God. Not because we are, but because God has given us this thing that now we can take and walk in, that we can take and make an effort in. And as, as we do, as we step into that, we experience what it's like to be that. We experience the life of God. Now, our text puts that in terms of, of participation. It talks about that we are participating in the divine nature. And that's a great phrase. Now, that word participation comes from the Greek word koinonia. Right? Same root. How many of you know that word? <laughs> You're not going to tell me it's the jazz band, right, from the... There was a, a Christian jazz band around called Koinonia at one time, which, you know, I like jazz, so that kind of worked out well. But uh, nonetheless, that's not what it's about. This is a word that, that generally uh, that you'll find referenced, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it talks about us participating in the Lord's Supper. It's talking about sharing. It's talking about participating. And what this text is telling us is that it's God's intention for us to participate in, to share in the divine nature. And we do this, we participate in the divine nature as we make the effort to do the thing that divine nature makes possible. You understand what I'm saying? It, it's, it's in participating in the divine nature, that's when we really get to know who God is. You'll never know the love of God in your own heart until you are loving with the heart of God. You'll never know what it's like to be the hand of Jesus until you are actually extending the hand of Jesus. You, you never know what it's like to experience God until you, because of the promise of God's Spirit in you, because of the grace that has provided everything that you need for a life of godliness in Christ Jesus, because the promise of grace has made it possible for you by faith you step into it and in doing so you experience what it's like to have life on God's level it's an incredible thing see we 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 just are so prideful at times and somehow or another we're not convinced I think in our own minds that we really are that much of a basket case and so we'll spin our wheels through our experience in Christianity, trying to, you know, trying to turn ourselves into a different shape. And we're frustrated. And we find it difficult. And we don't know why, after all the efforts that we make, we still have bad thoughts. We still have spiteful spirits. We still speak hurtful words. We still find ourselves tempted to do things that we know we don't want to do. And sometimes we drive ourselves nuts when we say to ourselves, man, this ought to be out of you by now. Hey, friends, let me tell you something. It'll never be out of you. That's you. That's, that's what you are natively. You're broken in sinfulness. There's no good thing that dwells in you. You natively are something that is beyond repair. You, you can't fix it. You can't change the shape of it. The only thing that can be done with the old us is to dispose of it. We do that by faith now, ultimately, when the rapture comes, it changed in the twinkling of an eye, it will be done away once and for all then. But in the meantime, the truth is, is that as long as you live and breathe air, you're going to be visited by thoughts that come out of your old nature. You're going to be visited by desires that come out of your old nature. You're going to be visited by temptation to relate to people that comes out of your old nature. Your old self doesn't promise anything but trouble. And yet, how often do we as Christians depend on that old nature to try to dress ourselves up or fix ourselves up or transform ourselves into something that really, to tell you the truth, is nothing but a pig with lipstick on? This is not God's intention for us, and God knows better than to expect anything else from us. So what does God do? In his grace, he does this. He gives us his nature. He imports into us what isn't there natively. 
And if we can buy into this, if we can understand this, then see, that gives us the basis for building something on the grace of God. God's love has saved me. Now I find myself frustrated because I can't live up to it. I find myself frustrated because no matter how hard I try, I still get visited by the things that pull me back or pull me down. Oh, woe is me. And, you know, a lot of the church world is based, all of their teaching is based on somehow or another just trying harder. Any amens out there? Amen. Just try harder. Guess what happens when you just try harder to dress up that pig? You just get more frustrated with the smell of bacon. It's just a frustrating thing to do. And all of it is because on the one hand we don't understand grace, and on the other hand we don't understand how to avoid false humility. What we need to do is see things the way God sees them. In his gracious perception and his kind heart toward us, he saves us. And he gives us everything that we need for a life of godliness in Christ Jesus. These precious promises he gives to us because of the nature of his own heart, because of the nature of who he is inside. And these promises that he gives us is that we would be able to participate, to share in the divine nature. Not that we're left to our own devices. Not that we're left to the limits of our own broken selves. But that he brings to us the participation, the sharing in the divine nature. And if we will buy into that, if our faith can embrace that, then we can make efforts to express it. We can make efforts to express it. And as we make efforts to express it, guess what? In every effort we make to express that thing that God has gifted into us, we experience what it's like to be God, to be Jesus in particular. We experience what it is to know Jesus. Because you don't know Jesus till you walk a mile in his shoes. You don't know Jesus until you have love with the love that he has. You don't know what it is to, until you relate with, to, to other people the way he related to other people. You don't know these things until you actually, by the gift of God, Step into the experience provided for you by the participation in the divine nature, and then you know. You know Jesus not because you know facts about him. You know Jesus because you are experiencing his life. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you understanding this today? Amen. What a wonderful thing that God has done to us. Now, it tells us the, 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 the outcome of this, the practical outcome in our text is that we should make every effort. That, I think, is a, a, an unfortunate choice of words on the part of the NIV translators. Because when you hear a phrase like that, make every effort, I mean, that just, that has so much legalistic baggage that comes with it, right? Make every effort. You know, that seems like, get out the wood, get out the wood tools, it's time to try to change my shape. And that's really not what it's saying. Um, in, in the in the, the the original in the Greek language, the whole the whole concept of every effort's not even there. With a single word, the the English translators here translate a three word phrase, but the single word is earnestness. Earnestness, with earnestness. Now, what's the what's what does that mean, earnestness? Uh, you know, in, in context, does that not mean make every effort? No, not really. What it means is that you don't dilly-dally around. What it means is you, you put your nose to the grindstone and get on with it. And that's, you know, that is probably some of the most practical scriptural counsel that we can get from the Word of God. Stop dilly-dallying around if you really believe this. If you believe that God intends you to participate in the divine nature, then stop fiddling around, stop messing about, and get on with it. Put it into gear and go forward. You have what you need determined to experience it. Now, as I said, you're also going to experience a reality that you're still you. You still have the stupid thoughts you used to have. You still have the stupid desires that you used to have. 
You still have the same stupid temptation that's bogging you down and messing with you that you used to have. I mean, the fact of the matter is, your old person, the person that you were natively, doesn't get over sin, doesn't get over selfishness. It's there, it was there when you were born, and it's going to be in that old nature when that old nature is done away with. But the promise of God is that something has come in alongside of that, if you will, something apart from that. And that thing that has come into us has opened up this experience. And if you buy into that experience, what should your attitude be if you have faith? Let's get on with it. I, I want to go for that. There's the solution. I can know God this way. I can experience life on God's terms this way. I can get to know what it was like to be Jesus this way. And that's God's, that's God's intention for us. So much of Christianity, it seems to me, stops and moves no forward with a false concept of grace. You know, grace is God winking at the sinfulness of mankind. Grace is God in a grandfatherly way wishing he wouldn't have made such strict rules. Grace is God realizing after he kicked the kid out of the house for not behaving well, now he really regrets it and he wants to bring the kid back in. That's not God's grace. That's not how the grace of God is operates, it's not what the grace of God is, it's not what the grace of God is trying to do. The grace of God is this. God in the kindness and the goodness of his heart wants to share life as he experiences, life as he knows it with us. To that end, he's provided for us a salvation. To that end, he's given us the promise of the Holy Spirit. And here is grace. And here is being saved by grace. Not that God is winking at all your fleshly and earthly shenanigans. The grace is this, is that despite the fact that those things are still part of your mind, part of your heart, hopefully they're not too much part of your experience, but despite that, God is dedicated to bringing the experience of his nature to you. So get on with it. Stop spinning your wheels trying to make yourself better. Get on with experiencing the promise of God. Get on with experiencing what the Spirit brings to your life. Get on with experiencing those things and get yourself diligent about it. Because here's the thing that you gain in being diligent about it, that you'll never fall away. That you'll never take a left turn that is unfixable. And that in the end, you'll have a rich welcome, a warm welcome into the kingdom that God is preparing for us. God has, in his kindness, made life available to us at his level. It's there. It's there for us. But we've got to take it and walk in. Galatians chapter 5 basically says the same thing, right? If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Because here's the thing. If we're not diligent about this, what are we, what's going to be coming out of you? Will your faith be productive? Will your faith be effective? No. If you don't get on with it, you'll look just like the average sloth. You'll look no different than somebody who won't be going into eternity. That's a really lousy place to be. But if we are productive, if we are embracing this by faith, we will be productive, we will be effective in our faith, and we'll get to know Jesus from experience. You know, you don't know a plumber. You don't truly know a plumber until you try to plumb. You, don't, you won't understand that plumber. You won't get that plumber. The, uh, the thoughts of that plumber won't make sense to you. 
to get under that sink, get your hands dirty, and suddenly you'll see things you didn't see before, you'll understand things you didn't understand before, you'll be aware of things you weren't aware of before, and you'll think things you didn't think before. We have this great promise. This promise of participation in the divine nature through the grace of God. Because we have been given this, what should our response, the response of faith be? It should be the, the response that says, I'm getting on with this. I'm not looking what, what was behind. I'm not looking at what happened yesterday. I'm looking to see what God has for me today. If that's you, you'll be fruitful and effective and your life will know the blessing of God. Would you stand with me this morning and pray?